cuts into your lifestyle to do that stuff. We were, we were at a trade show in, in Palm Springs, California one spring, the week of the University of California spring break. And so Palm Spring was full of drunk youngsters, right? Saturday morning, we get on the plane to come home, and you know, these sorry looking dudes stagger onto the plane all sunburned and hung over. And we get on the end of the runway, it's already 110 degrees and they can't take off because the plane is too loaded. So they say, we're going to offer an overnight stay to anybody who wants to stay in Palm Springs another night. And you know, on a business trip, normally nobody wants to get off. There was a rush to the front of the plane of all these. T uh, the free night here, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Good morning, folks. So I had a question for you. If for next year, I'm thinking of eliminating homework. What do you think about that? A replacement would be a deadline every lab. So lab one, there's a deadline, which will be part of the, the final, the, of the project itself. So you come in lab one, there's a deadline. Lab two, there's a deadline. If there's a lab three, then, then you do the, the, the demo. What do you think of that versus homework? There's another possibility, and that is no homework, no deadlines. You have, you have two weeks to do the project. If you don't do it, you get killed. Those are the three options I can think of. Oh, there's another option, too, and that is weekly quizzes. That got a shake of the head. Does, who has an opinion? Yes? By deadlines, you mean like earlier than what, our deadline? So, week one of this lab, for instance, would be you have to be able to hover the motor. Week two, you have to do the full demo. Isn't that what we're, what we're there's no doubt. There's no. There's no deadline for the first lab. Oh, I, see. I, see. I see. Every lab period gotcha. would have a deadline. That means you have to start working before the first lab of a of a cycle. I see. So, so leaving it, leaving it without deadlines in the center of the lab, then gives you more scheduling flexibility for, for other events. And I, I appreciate that. Okay, that's reasonable. But the homework is, I mean, the homework is really read the damn documentation is what it amounts to in this class. And you could do that without homework. Except, when people do just-in-time learning. That means you have to have, to have just-in-time deadlines all the time. So, what other opinions? Yeah. Uh, the, like, various goals, like, as you go through, will be fine, but I don't know if, like, you might need more TAs to do it, because, like, you to stop. Oh, there is that, yes. Uh, I've, at, in various times in the past, I've said there is assigned homework, but you don't have to hand it in. Rather, the TA is going to quiz you in the first lab. And that works very, very well, because everybody hates an oral exam. And, but it's awfully hard on the TAs. So I stopped doing that, because it took an hour and a half to go through the whole lab, usually. So... What's the consensus? Stick with the current system? I like the current system too. You like it? You like it? Okay. All right, thanks. Okay. We'll stay. All right then. Um, some thoughts about the current assignment. One is that we, on, on this potentiometer, 
my example showed clip leads on here, but you're going to solder wires on there. And the reason you're going to solder wires is that then you can strip three leads of the, of the ribbon cable off, solder the three leads to, the, to these three terminals, and since the leads are close together and they follow the same path through space, you tend to get some cancellation of, of noise induced into the wires. And that's going to be important as we determined yesterday and so I strongly suggest you do that by the way interestingly on the ribbon cable right now nobody likes the last three colors apparently in the ribbon cable because there's six feet of it laying on the floor with just those three wires I'm, I'm fascinated by that <clears throat> so the other thing that we discovered yesterday was that <clears throat> even with this low pass filter there's a fair amount of noise that appears on the output of the op amp presumably because it's being induced it's coming into the op amp through the power supply <clears throat> There's various solutions for this. Sitting with Eldar yesterday in lab, uh, it seemed like the most effective thing to do was to put a 0.1 microfarad capacitor from the output of the op amp to ground as close to the ADC input as possible. Not quite clear why this works because a capacitor by itself is not exactly a low pass filter. It needs a resistor to set a time constant. So what I'm inferring from that is that the equivalent resistance of the capacitor itself is somehow interacting with that, but I don't know. But if you put a, a 0.1 microfarad capacitor from here to ground, it effectively shorts out, I'd say, what, 90% of the, of the spike noise. The spike noise has two major sources. One is the SPI channel or channels and the other is the ADC itself is inducing some noise onto the line. Hmm, I don't know what that means. Put a capacitor here and since you're going to be using a, a trim potentiometer as an input for your parameters, or at least some of you are, you should put a capacitor on the output of that also for before it goes into the ADC. Any questions on that? Second thing is setting up the ADC to do two, to do two channels. Who's set up so far set up the ADC to do two channels? And how did you do it? I know how you did it. I'm going to show them. Yeah, how did you do it? Uh, I just looked at like, the example code on, uh, if you went to the PLIVE and the PLIVE you see the example. You actually like read the documentation? Fantastic! And it worked. And that's the using MUX A and MUX B example. So. Yeah. How'd you do it? Uh, we just uh, had two different channels and then wrote to each one. So you, you set you did a set a, a set channel, uh, yeah. set channel and that worked. Yeah. Okay. I expected that to work, although we had some trouble with it yesterday. Yes. What else? What other ways have people done it? <coughs> so I bothered to document this here. Thank you, Eldar. And. The, there's a couple of critical things. One is you want auto sampling on because you're going to use a feature of the ADC. There's two, there's two different options for automatically swapping channels. There's the skip list 
which allows you to cycle through any number of channels up to 16. We don't have 16 channels, but it's, it supports up to 16. And then there's an alternate between MUX A and MUX B. If you remember back to the, to the analog to digital description, analog to digital description, ADC, there's two muxes here, there's a mux A, a mux A and a mux B and you can choose between them. Ah, uh, there's, I see they twisted this at an angle, so there's an A and there's a B there, very oddly positioned kind of things. But you can choose between the two muxes, and what we did here is to, is to set up the system in the usual way, except... It turned on, oh, I bet you can't see that at all. Turned off the alternate buffer. Oh, what a, our alternate buffer. So the output of the, hum, why can't I reposition this today? the output of the A to D converter goes into a stack over here or a list of buffers and we're going and there's actually two sets of buffers so that you can read one and write the other from the A to D converter but we're going to turn that off so that we're always reading from ADC buffer 0 and 1 so we're setting the alternate buffer off And and we're setting ADC alt input on. It says by setting alt input on, what we're doing is to say use channel A, then channel B, or mux A, then mux B, then mux A, then mux B, every other reading. And then slowed down the, the ADC a little bit. My code for the ADC was originally coded for the best optimized throughput, which can only happen if the PB bus is set to 30 megahertz by setting it to 40 megahertz the ADC is actually running a little too fast and so you have to modify these two parameters just slightly to slow it down so this is a slower it takes 15 uh, 15 ticks for a, a, a bit and the sample time is doubled we're enabling two channels in this case one and five we're turning off the scan. We are then setting up channels sample A and sample B for the two muxes. And after that, we could do a read buffer 0 and a read buffer 1 to get the value of the two channels. So this is going to go in main and then in the interrupt service routine or someplace you're going to read these two channels. One thing that doesn't work is if you turn auto sampling off 
which we did initially to cut down on noise, sampling noise, then the, the auto switch between A and B channel doesn't work. So you have to leave auto sample on. But if you've got it working, don't change it. Let me remind you that the PWM setup, this, this example code is not meant to be a template for this lab. This example code turns on two output compare units, which you do not need to do. You need to turn on one. One of them is set up as a PWM, the other one is set up as something else, just a, a pulse generator. You don't want to turn this one on. You just want one channel. You need to set it up, associate it with an output pin, and then set the PWM time using set uh, DCOC 3 PWM to the PWM on time, which will be probably between 0 and 40,000. Has anybody coded this up using floating point? Does it work? That's what I'm interested in. Is it fast enough? Does, has anybody tried that? I don't know if it's fast enough or not. I'll try to get some lab hours over the weekend. Uh, the TAs seem to be running in overload mode, but I think I can get some hours over the weekend. Stay tuned on Piazza for that. Yes? Um, so I have a question about the PWM. Code. Sure. Um, we're noticing a weird defect when we try to combine like, some kind of uh, draw function, like write, write stuff to the screen um, with PWM. Like, for some reason, it doesn't for some reason, does it turn the screen white? Uh, it's like when the, when you, let's say you write like the ADC value to the screen, and you normally like just have like the rectangle to like erase it, but when the PWM is running with it, it like kind of like, it like, like half of it. Yeah, does it kind of like, like, like a wave? Like <laughs> so, it's a defect in your code. <laughs> <coughs> And the, there's a couple of problems. One is, if you cut and pasted the example P, uh, uh, PWM code without looking at the interrupt service routine, did you do that? Um, we got rid of all the URs. Did you get rid of the interrupt service routine? No, we did not. Did you notice what was in the interrupt service routine? Oh, we got rid of that. You did. Yes. Because I know that that breaks the, the TFT display. I saw that yesterday. Okay. So are you sure that you didn't use any I.O. pins that the, P, that the TFT is using? Mm, we're not sure. We can check that. You better check it because you know where that list is, right? So... If you go to the PIC32 development page, there is a sorted list of all of the I.O. pins that are used by So what is different today? about this display that I'm chopping stuff off. Hmm. I don't know what's different today. So you can't see this. This is R's and, and uh, this is RA 0 through 3 and these are RB's. And um, 
you should check to make sure it's really easy to forget that RB1 and RB2 and RB0 are all used by the TFT. If you use any of those for any reason, it blows the TFT away. What other problems people having? Anybody broken a prop? Anybody rammed a prop into their head? Good. So again, the order in which you should write the interrupt service routine is get the two output channels working before you do this before you do the control code. Then get the user interface working in a thread, then write the control algorithm because you're going to spend so much time recompiling when you're tuning that you will save net time if you have the user interface running first. And you ha absolutely have to have the uh, scope displays for debugging. For tuning. Do you want us to include the scope pictures into the lab, presumably, right? The lab write-up? Well, interestingly enough, it says that <laughs> in the lab write-up. Do you want us to purposely de-tune like, the... Because it doesn't look very interesting if it's tuned. It's a very boring... Uh, you mean when it's right, it's boring? Yes. Well, that's like, yeah, true. Pictures, like, you know, that doesn't really... So, this is what you'd... I mean, hopefully you, you're going to get something like that. Maybe without the, 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 the annotation on it. But, yeah, it is a little boring. Yeah? Uh, this is a different question. Okay. If, if but, but, I would say, if you think it's important to typical two trace if you think it's important to show non-optimized versions to show the process by which you did this absolutely put them in can't hurt to have a little more data uh, so I have a question about the noise on the uh, motor control mm -hmm. signal uh, on the scope uh, so I I've applied the low pass filter uh, but I'm still getting a lot of noise, especially when it's around kind of the zero. Like, it, it's near the correct angle. There's still, like, a lot of spikes. Um, uh, and it, does, it doesn't look anything close to... Uh, as, qui as quiet... I mean, this is fairly noisy. Yeah, it, it's worse than that, to be honest. Uh, okay. And so I, I'm wondering if, if there's other ways to, to reduce noise out of the motor control. Well, sure. So you could do an analog low-pass filter. Mm -hmm. You could spread this out and try and find the source of the noise. I mean, this is, this is down at like a half second per, uh, two and a half seconds per division. And so this noise is probably highly aliased and is pro might well be related to SPI noise. <clears throat> in which case you may be able to reroute some wires or, or mess with the ground connection and get better signal and noise, but it, you have to know what the source of the noise is here. Otherwise, you could low-pass filter analog. However, you're also going to lose the fast transient if you make the low-pass much lower frequency than probably... Uh, uh, 100 radians a second or maybe 200 radians a second. <coughs> so let's look at it in the lab. <coughs> There's lots of noise sources for this lab. Having the wires for the potentiometer near the wires for the sensor sorry, for the motor, having the sensor wires and the potentiometer near the wires for the motor can destroy your potentiometer reading. 
So if the motor wires are laying over the top of the wires that go from the sensor, you may have it so corrupted by spike noise from the motor that it's unusable for control. So geometry actually matters in this lab. If you can't keep the wires apart and you think that the, the, it's, you're getting spike corruption, then you can prove it by hooking an oscilloscope to the line, see what it looks like. Once you do that, if you find you still have noise, then you could go as far as wrapping the sensor lines in aluminum foil or the motor lines in aluminum foil to, to, uh, and then grounding the aluminum foil to act as an electrostatic shield. You can also start bypassing power supplies. So coming off of the off of the off the big board is uh, VDD and ground. By the time you run those over to the white board, they ha there's a significant inductance. You can get spikes induced across that inductance, and you can short those out on the white board by putting a capacitor between the rails. So you may find that you need to you need to bypass the the power supplies at the at the rails on the whiteboard or even at the op amp. What else? PID controller all clear, you don't need to go over that again. You're all good on that. Any other questions? Well, let's talk about final project. Coming right up, starts next week. We want weekly progress reports on the final project. Yeah? Oh, so we're going to set up the PID teams, the three PID teams, but why are we tuning the PID if we're going to set up the PID teams? That's what tuning the PID is, is setting the gains. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by tuning. Right, but we're going to, like, on the, on the user input, we're going to set the speed factors. Uh-huh. Um, I'm confused. If we're going to tune it, it's, a, it's a, like a value storing in the system. So why do we need to set the speed So how are you going to tune this? Are you going to hard code them and then recompile every time you change the values? That's very time inefficient. You might change them a hundred times. So you're going to tune it by using the interface to set the values. Then, once you get those values, you're going to hard code those as the initial conditions so that when you turn it on and hit reset, you get this optimized four angles. To show us that you actually have a working user interface, then we're going to ask you to change them. What else? So, you should probably read Lab 5 fairly soon, like this weekend in your spare time. We're going to we're going to rank order the, the projects and then assign grades based on the rank order. And about 30% depends on the project grade at the end of the class. 20% is, did you work every week? Did you show progress every week? If your progress reports are, we did nothing, you're going to lose progress points. So. 20% is depends on being prepared and, and progress, 30% on how well it worked, and 50% as usual on the write-up. And groups of members of a group can be graded differentially if we detect that somebody is not doing anything. Once again, there will be a bonus for finishing early. Here's a table of days and points. Earliness number of days early is relative to your last lab period. 
So I think the last lab period is on what? December 2nd? 1st? Whatever the Friday is. So I think it's Friday the 1st. So early is relative to your last day of lab. Yes. What's normal? Sorry, like, just like, uh, you mean like paper? Yeah. No. The only thing you're going to hand in is a website. You're going to zip up your website, all of the dependent files. That means, to be obsessively correct, you need to zip it all up send it to somebody who does not have that web file uh, that, that on their on their computer and make sure it opens because it's really easy to think you're linking up photos which are in a different directory and then all the photos break and so you're going to make a web page you're going to send it to me in the web page there's going to be a couple of statements. These are required now by Cornell. In Appendix A, there will be two, one of two sentences. The group approves this report for inclusion in the course website or does not approve. You will put one of those in. You don't put them in, you lose five points automatically. Because then I have to ping you. I get tired of that. <coughs> It has to be one of two sentences. The group approves the video for inclusion on the course YouTube channel or does not approve. There's various reasons for approving or not approving. You have to choose. Let's say you're going to go for a patent. Don't put it on the website. It counts as a publication and after it's a, an object, a, a idea is published you have only one year to patent it in the US and zero time to patent it any place outside the US. Okay. And I think we looked it up. Yes? For finishing early, is it just including the demo or also the website? For finishing early, the, the, the website is due on the day that the university specifies for this course time for final project reports, which I believe is, if I remember right from this discussion a month ago or so, somebody looked it up and I believe it was the... 6th of December but I'll have it I'll, I'll have that up shortly so all reports are due the 6th of December you demo early it is your it's the demo of the performance of the device you will then write after that write the the report Web page has to be portable in HTML format and not linked to a proprietary server. All oh, these weasel words. That's because I want these things to be more like a textbook and less like a flash animation, right? I want them to be servable on our server one year. I didn't specify that it had to be in portable HTML on our server and somebody brought it up on uh, uh, Wix which is a proprietary format with their own system, WIX.com. Brought it up on their own server with their own format. I couldn't download it. The students couldn't maintain it. It's gone. And that is not acceptable. So you have to write it in HTML. You can use whatever HTML tool you know and love. It could be VI. 
if you're a masochist. It could be Dreamweaver. You can get a 30-day free license for Dreamweaver, I believe. But there's lots of other tools that do more or less WYSIWYG editing of web pages. The worst thing you can do, oh, I'll take it, but it's so ugly, is to write it in Word and then do a save as HTML. And the reason it's bad is that when you do a save as HTML, it produces a million custom tags that only work in IE. Who uses IE here? Right, that's what I thought. So, <clears throat> and every tag it doesn't recognize is replaced by a question mark in a square. So you get this horrible mess of crappy formatting mixed with question marks. So, I'm going to encourage you also to submit projects to various websites, various blog sites, Hackaday and Hack Gadgets are among two of the better known. A mention on Hackaday is worth approximately 3,000 views of a video that you put up on YouTube. So it's a huge amplifier of, of student work. A lot of people look at Hackaday. And I'll help any group try to get their, uh, their project into a print magazine. That would be in the writing seminar next semester, not this semester. So, as we said before, no projectile devices or weapons of any kind. No alcohol or drug related projects except perhaps a breathalyzer or similar device. No vaping units. No, no, yeah, you get it. You have to budget everything that you use. The so microstick, well, microstick this year, you're not using microstick. The uh, each whiteboard will cost you six dollars of budget. That's meant to be high enough that if you don't solder board stuff, it hurts in terms of budget. I want you to solder board. Solder boards are cheaper in the budget and they're more reliable. If you use one of our power, if you use a power supply, five bucks. You don't pay me that. That's the budget number. Right? You're, you're sort of speak. It's funny money. You're renting it, right? Custom PC board, five dollars. That's if you're using the big board. One pick thirty-two is five bucks. TFT LCD is ten bucks. You solder this in. You're buying me a new one for twenty-five. Yes. Anything you use in debug and then don't use in the final project is not budgeted. It's what is in the final project. Each jumper cable you use with the little pin on each end, 10 cents. That's my actual cost. If you use 100 of those, it's going to start to add up. Solder is your friend in terms of budget. Wire is free. When you, I, I, I put down this thing about SOIC, SOIC, uh, or SOT23 carriers. When you buy, I, I'm willing to put in orders for about $20 per group. Yes. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a cost for using wood? What? Is there a cost for using wood? 
Buy it yourself. You can buy it at the Cornell store. They have a nice supply of wood there. Top dollar. But it's nice wood. But uh, yeah, we, we have some wood around the lab. And you're welcome to use that. But if it's not in the lab, you have to buy it. I have a little bit of wood. So when you buy integrated circuits, if I buy integrated circuits for you, the, the scheme is going to be every Monday morning, I'm going to put in an order up to $20 per person one time. That's not over, not per week. That's once. $20. <clears throat> and you can, you can ask for up to $20 of random parts. When you specify integrated circuits, quite often the cheapest circuit you can specify will be one you can't solder because it has no leads. That's why it's cheap. It'll be a leadless package. Look at the package that you're ordering and see if you can physically solder it. If you have any doubt, come talk to me. You can always, P-dip is easy. That's pluggable. SOIC is easy. Small outline integrated circuit. Has a pin pitch of 0.05 inches. TSSOP so, PDIP is easy, SOIC is easy, TSSOP, so this is 0 0.1 inch, 2.54 millimeters for the metric inclined. This is 0 0.05 inches, this is 0 0.025 inches. That's beginning to get hard. I can do that with a soldering iron and a microscope. Uh, but it does take a little bit of practice. You go down another factor of two, and none of us can do that without, without an air, an air uh, hot air gun and uh, solder paste, which we have. But you've got to really want to do it. How much for the solder paste? <laughs> solder paste is free on the other hand you have to realize of course that solder pa all of these all of these are the result of somebody gaming the system <laughs> that's why there's so many rules people game the system well you didn't say this <laughs> yeah right so solder paste is a water solution of five micron spheres of lead. You take it and you go like this between your fingers, beep, and you have just tattooed yourself with lead. Don't do that. It's not good for you. You have to get to sand your fingertips off then. So, and one, <laughs> Two, three years ago, we had people buy, oh man, we found these amazingly cheap video cameras. They're like a buck and a half each. Uh, wow. What do they look like? Oh, wow, they're really small. Uh-oh. Uh so they ordered them. I don't check leads. When I order, I'm ordering 100 parts. I put in the part number into the DigiKey search field. If it comes up, I order it. If it doesn't come up, I delete it. I don't check. I don't do error correction. I assume you know what you're doing. These people ordered ball grid, ball grid video cameras. You know what a ball grid array is? It's a package and on the bottom of the package are little solder bumps like this. They don't come out to the edge of the package. The only way to solder them is to solder paste them mush them on there, heat gun them, and hope for the best. The success rate is 1% or so. Don't do that. So you have to check the packages. A few things one group wrote one year about doing this. I won't bore you with that. At least 50% of the work has to be done on PIC32 series chips. If you want to interface to an app, you want to interface to a PC, 
you can put up to 50% of the work on the other device. Then there is a very long outline of what I want to see in the, in the report. And this is some mashup of what I think is important and what Abbott thinks is important. In particular, you will address ethics and standards and legality. Use a, you use a wireless device of any kind. I want to see the I want you to be able to prove that you read the FCC regulations on that part. And then a very important part is a description of how to actually submit the project. And you can email it to me if it's too big, use dropbox.cornell.edu. Most people will read Dropbox and put it someplace else. Sometimes I can get to them, sometimes the permissions are set up incorrectly. Use dropbox.cornell.edu. It's a local Dropbox. It is secure. I know it's from you, and you know I got it. Windows, for reasons that escape me, is not case sensitive in file names. And so images that work on your Windows system in your web page will fail on the Linux server if you use a capital JPEG and you meant lowercase JPEG. And most of you will check that and that's fine. But there's some Windows utilities that under some circumstances change the case of file names for you. Have you run into that? Oh, just shoot me. Copy sometimes does that. Not always. It depends on the length of the name as far as I can tell. If it's an eight digit or less name, it treats it as Windows 3 and uppercases it. God. <laughs> Who thought that one up? So you have to check by sending this whole disaster to yourself and then unzipping it and testing it. That's the only way to do it. Four slashes, not backslashes. It's Linux. Alpha characters, underscores. No spaces, no punctuation in any file name. Underscore. No spaces. And the directory name consisting of the group's concatenated net IDs. So, so the reason for that is, of course, uniqueness. I don't want to have 20 directories that are all called final project. But more importantly, the way I write recommendations is to go to that web page and search on NetID to find the report written by a person three years from now so I can go back and find out what they wrote. So this acts as a search key for doing recommendations years in the future. Use it. Otherwise I have to get into the, into the report, get into the report, find out people's names, look up their net IDs and fabricate the, the, file, the, the, the folder name so that I can find it in the future. It's poor policy to make the greater grumpy. Don't wait to the last day to write the report. You can start it the day you start your project. It's worth half of the grade, folks some effort into it. It's worth more than the final demo. Put a lot of hours into it.
when we stop lecturing, which will be maybe a week into the final projects, there will be no other assignment for this course except being in lab. This is a four credit class. I therefore will expect you to be in lab 12 hours a week. 12 hours a week. That's the workload. Even after we're done with the final project? If you, if you demo out, you're done. But 12 hours a week. You're done. All you have to do after you demo out, if you demo out 14 days early, you're done, except for the report, of course. You don't have to write that in lab. Either. No, you don't have to write it in lab. You can, you know. <laughs> You can write it on a system 370 for all I care, but, but uh, uh, yeah, once you're, once you're done with the, the demo out, you're done in lab. Until that time, I want to see you there a lot. There's also a fairly general rule, and that is if, if let's say that you've put in a lot of work and things have just gone wrong because you pick something too hard or the parts kept breaking and they're, they're more fragile than you thought. If we see you work, that counts a lot. I mean, if we see a working result, that's fine. If we don't see a working result, it blows up in smoke and we've seen you there every day for hours a day working on it. then you're liable to do better. Or put a different way, if your boss doesn't see you work, you're not working. So, show up during the day so I can see what you're doing. I can give you some feedback. I can catch errors that you might not catch or the TAs might not catch because I've been doing this way too long. So, Show up during the week, during the day. I'm going to be there. I'll have the lab open 30 hours a week. Come in and talk. Okay, next week, more lab. I'll take questions on lab four. Otherwise, we'll start on other stuff. Maybe some plagiarism.